how are we doing this morning? So there is a doctor out of, where's this at? Flint? Is it Flint, Michigan, maybe? Yeah, it's in Michigan. He's facing a civil lawsuit of accused sexual assault. <gasps> Let's see what happens. Wait a minute. We're going to watch this video. Serving allegations against a mid-Michigan doctor who is accused of sexual assault. The allegations are in a civil lawsuit filed against the Saginaw area doctor and the healthcare organization that he was affiliated with at the time. So, Terry, first of all, is the doctor still working? Well, Angie and Matt, he shouldn't be as a doctor in the state because the Michigan Board of Medicine has suspended his license. The lawsuit has been filed by one alleged victim, but a state investigation indicates there are others who have complained. The allegations are of a very serious sexual nature. This lawsuit filed by a young woman from the Saginaw area who we are not identifying is making those serious allegations against Dr. Aaron Vera. He was employed through Covenant Healthcare and worked out of this office in Saginaw Township. The woman began seeing the doctor in 2016, but her attorney, Eric Miles, says the first signs of inappropriate behavior began in 2019 when the alleged victim was about 20 years old. Regarding touching and inappropriate comments and inappropriate communications with patients, um, outside of the, the medical office. The lawsuit states shortly after the behavior began, the woman had her father come to an appointment with her, which she claims upset Vera. There are four counts in the lawsuit, including assault and battery and medical malpractice. There is evidence to suggest that there are more victims at this time. That evidence say. appears to be in this Michigan Board of Medicine administrative complaint, which details the allegations made by the woman in the lawsuit, but indicates two other patients also filed complaints. The two patients accused the doctor of similar actions. According to the Michigan Licensing and Regulatory Affairs website. Hang on, did y'all see that? Let's read this really quick. It says. Respondent was something family medicine doctor since she was a child. Respondent informed him that he handled to see him. What? That she needed to see him for her yearly breast and vaginal examination instead of seeing her OBGYN. What? After so she was a doctor too? What? I'm confused. After she was seeing him. I think that's what it's saying. She was she was seeing the family medical doctor since she was a child. He informed her that she needed to see him for a yearly breast and vaginal exam. After the respondent performed the gyno examination on her, he frequently gave her full body hugs while she was only wearing her examination gown. During these full body hugs, she could feel his erect penis as he pushed it against her leg. Ugh, he's disgusting. During an appointment on July 2022, 20, the respondent attempted to hug and press his, you know what, against her knee again. That's all, I, that's all I can see. It looks like it's by the woman duty. in the lawsuit, but indicates two other patients oh, yes, also filed complaints. Them. The two patients accused the doctor of similar actions. According to the Michigan Licensing and Regulatory Affairs website, Vera's medical license has been suspended. Also named in the lawsuit, Covenant Healthcare, which Miles claims was aware of a previous complaint against Vera. Had Covenant uh, acted appropriately at the time that they had notice of Dr. Vera's inappropriate conduct. Uh, at least one of the assaults on my client would not have occurred. I wonder I, if they I, had I, a medical malpractice coverage in place for this facility and for the doctor himself. I know that in Florida, they've medical malpractice had gotten so expensive that they were allowing people, the doctors to go without it. They just had to display postings within their office, like in the front office, stating that they did not carry it. I could not reach uh, Dr. Vera or his attorney for comment. Now, a Covenant spokesperson says it does not comment on pending litigation, but it will cooperate with any investigation into this matter. It's not clear when Covenant severed ties with Vera. And the other thing, too, is you don't know, like, when it comes to medical malpractice coverage, something like this would obviously be excluded because it's a criminal act. A young Colorado woman plunged to her death from a hotel roof in New York City moments after a violent and very public fight with her boyfriend. According to police and witnesses, 20, she's only 20, 20 year old 
Desiree Anderson and her boyfriend, Tyler Griffin, were visiting the Big Apple to introduce his parents to their eight-month-old daughter. The physical altercation was so disturbing and loud that night that several hotel guests called 911 in fear of Anderson's life. Katie VR station, who I'm reading this article from, spoke with her mother, who was reeling from the loss of her daughter and trying to bring her granddaughter back home to Colorado to be with the family. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine? The baby girl is currently in the custody of the Administration for Children's Services in New York City. She says, I just keep thinking about how scared and confused she must be given that she's only eight months old. I just want to get her back home where she's still with the people she knows and feels safe. As of Thursday night, Young was also fighting to bring her daughter's body back to Colorado for a proper burial. So let's watch this quick video. A woman from Colorado is dead. Her boyfriend is in custody and family members say the couple's eight month old baby is in child protective services. After police say a fight between the couple turned physical and ended with her death after falling from a New York City building. Nine News reporter Jennifer Meckel spoke with family and friends today who are trying to understand what happened and they're trying to bring her body and her baby back home to Colorado. Tuesday night in Midtown, New York City, a woman falls to her death from a hotel roof. Family members identify the victim as 20-year-old Desiree Anderson, a young mom from Colorado, visiting New York City with her boyfriend, Tyler, and their eight-month-old daughter, Aaliyah. New York police were called to the Oyo Hotel for an assault. They learned two people were fighting and it got physical. Witnesses say it spilled out into the hallways. People were trying to intervene, help the baby. Somehow, it's still not clear, Desiree ended up on the hotel roof before falling to her death. Police arrested 24-year-old Tyler Griffin. He's now charged with assault, reckless endangerment, and child endangerment. And a young mom who loved her daughter, a daughter they said she would never choose to leave behind. Police have not determined how Desiree fell. If it was a push, a trip, a jump, her loved ones tell me they did not know about any violence in this relationship and they do not believe that she would have jumped. Now they're raising money and they're working with New York officials to try to bring home her body and the baby back to Colorado. Yeah, hopefully those efforts bring that baby back home. It's sad. Very sad. Which, by the way, do I even need to say it? <laughs> I had fun doing that one. As soon as John, uh, John Bubba said it in a, in a live, we were on one of the bro lives and he said something about his oatmeal, his oats, his oafs meals. And I was like, oh, hell no. We're going to have to do a Quaker ad. <laughs> so there it is for you guys. Anyway, um, you can always go and see what's going on. But this was something that. They've approved to us. They've approved to assist parade attack first responders, and it says that on Tuesday the Common Council unanimously approved unanimously approved federal grant funding in the amount of four hundred and seventy eight thousand five hundred sixty four hundred dollars. People forget a lot of these first responders they were victims too in all this. They struggle with PTSD from. Can you imagine? Can you imagine having to go in and take care of all these people? And, and, and what they saw and heard that day, Ugh. anyway, um, through the anti-terrorism and emergency assistance program administered through the Waukesha Department of Justice, they said that, um, they explained that the funding is for the first responders, both in the city and surrounding jurisdictions, who res responded to the November 21st, 2021 attack on the Waukesha Christmas Parade. Initially, the funding was to pass through the United Way, but Piper reported that the United Way agreed to remove themselves from the arrangement in order to more efficiently move funds to the city. Well, kudos to United Way, because I'm one of those that when I send my money in somewhere, I'm not, I don't want to be paying the CFO to be making mega bucks. If you're a non-freaking profit, then you should be a non-freaking profit. I don't want, that's just a whole nother soapbox for me to jump on. If you guys know what I'm talking about and feel the same way, drop it like it's hot in the comments. Okay, so it says, according to the memo submitted by Waukesha Police Department, Captain Dan Bowman, and he the blonde hottie, I think he is. The funds will be used for four programs that focus on the wellness and resiliency of the first responders impacted by the mass casualty event. The programs include first responder mental health and building on wellness and resiliency, wellness and resiliency liaison, 
first responder based community training and families of first responder anti fragility training. I like that a lot. The council also approved an initial resolution regarding industrial development revenue bond financing for robotics company Midwest Engineering Systems. I don't know what that is. That, that doesn't have anything to do with it. Anyway. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy about that. I feel good about that. I wanted to share that with you guys. So I, I put that up recently. The other thing I wanted to share with you guys is this right here. So they're doing a fundraiser and they're going to, the first responders are playing basketball and stuff. So let's watch this really quick. This ought to be kind of cool. I'll get you guys lined up. Waukesha South's varsity dance team is expanding across generations. From the first practice we had with them on Tuesday, everyone just came in with a very positive, upbeat attitude. Waukesha South High School students will be joined by the Milwaukee Dancing Grannies for a special halftime performance next month. It will take place during the annual Boots and Badges basketball game. It's the Waukesha uh, Fire and Police against New Berlin and Brookfield Fire and Police. For teacher Gina Nordrum, the dance collaboration is about healing. Some of the girls that we had were in the parade, and I know some of the grannies that are performing were in the parade as well. Money raised from the basketball game will help pay for the city's parade memorial at Grady Park. Awesome. But that's not all. It's a real honor that they, they chose um, to recognize the food pantry. Donations at the game will also benefit the food pantry serving Waukesha County. These women hope their steps. Able to participate in things that are done in and around Waukesha to support that memorial is really important. Keep this relationship in sync long after the game is over. It's almost a moment of closure to have all these people together and like showing how strong our community has become after this. In Waukesha, Brett Lemoyne, Fox 6 News. Isn't that cool? I love it. That's awesome. Okay, let's get out of that. It's an, uh, they're doing a halftime show. I really wish that they would, uh, it's Boots and Badges basketball game. If they were smart. Here's the, pay, here's the, oh, Kimmy needs to, <laughs> Kimmy needs to watch this one. She gets to see her men in action. Seriously, though, if they stream this on YouTube, they could make a lot of money. They really, really could. Because there's a lot of us that watch all this and really we want to be, a you know. It says, join us for the Boots and Badges basketball game between fire and police departments of Waukesha and New Berlin, Brookfield. $5 per person. Kids under, under free, under 12 free. So on April 12th of 2024. Okay, if you live in Waukesha, you guys, y'all need to go down there and get me some footage. That'd be fun to watch, huh? That's really cool. I like that. So there's been some kind of agreement given to the teachers or the administrators from the school that testified in the trial of James and Jennifer Crumbly. So let's listen to this. Tonight we are learning more about the agreements given to two Oxford school officials during the criminal prosecution of the deadly school shooting. The prosecutor says no immunity was given and maintains that her team did not have to turn over the proffer agreements to the Crumbly's lawyers, but defense attorneys disagree. Seven investigator Heather Catalo has a look at what information has been released and what's next in this case. After two different trials where two different juries found James and Jennifer Crumbly each guilty of involuntary manslaughter, questions are now being raised about the role of proffer agreements in the historic cases. Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald accused the parents of failing to take simple steps to prevent their 15-year-old son from accessing the gun that he used to murder four of his classmates inside Oxford High School. The truth is, one small effort could have saved their lives. Hannah St. Juliana, Tate Meir, Madison Baldwin, and Justin Schilling were shot to death on November 30th, 2021. The shooter is serving life in prison and his parents face up to 15 years behind bars. 
Earlier this week, news broke that school counselor Sean Hopkins and Oxford's former dean of students, Nicholas Ejak, were given something called proffer letters so the statements they provided to prosecutors could not be used to file charges against them. They were the last administrators to meet with the shooter before his rampage in the school. It is an agreement between a prosecutor's office and an individual that whatever they say, as long as they're truthful, would not be used against them. Late Wednesday, McDonald issued a press release explaining that the proffer agreements were never an implicit or explicit promise of immunity, leniency, or favoritism of any kind. There was absolutely no protection from prosecution for anyone. And the, the, the witnesses who testified were, were promised nothing and they were given nothing. McDonald also released the actual agreements. You can see Ejak signed his exactly one month after the shooting in 2021. And Hopkins signed his a few days later. The proffer agreements are addressed to the attorneys of the school officials and say Ejak and Hopkins received no promises of favorable consideration. But the deals also say this office will not offer any proffer statements made by you or your client in this office's case in chief in any criminal prosecution of your client. James Crumbly's attorney told the seven investigators on Monday that she had not been provided the proffers during the case. Were you ever given any information that there was some protection from prosecution offered to those witnesses? I don't recall ever receiving anything in writing from the prosecutor's office indicating that there were any protection for any of the school employees. What do you think about that? If it's true, I, I think that they should have told us. McDonald maintains she did not have to turn over the agreements during discovery. The only thing required to give to the defense is any agreement we've made with a with a witness that gives them a plea deal or immunity in exchange for their testimony under oath to prove our case. That was not done. Criminal Defense Attorneys of Michigan President Arthur Weiss disagrees. In 72, in the Giglio case, they said any type of agreements or understandings uh, that a prosecution witness has is to be disclosed. I would imagine they'll be filing a motion before sentencing with the court to set aside the conviction and ask for an evidentiary hearing so it can all be fleshed out. Prosecutor McDonald has said publicly there is not sufficient evidence to charge anyone from the school with a crime. But if new information were to come to light, that position could change. In the newsroom, I'm Heather Catalo, 7 Action News. There's an article here by Outlier, Outlier Media dated March 22nd of 2024. And it says that as we continue to explore here, let me show you, let me show the screen to you guys so you can see this. So you're not having to stare at my funky face the whole time. Look at how she looked back then. That was, when were they brought in? Was it a year? It took her a year to get all that weight. A lot of people have said because she gained so much weight is the reason was because she had definitely had to have been taken some when she was outside. For her to put on that kind of weight in prison, there ain't that many damn snack cakes from the commissary she can have access to you guys for her to get, gain that much weight. It had to have been something she was taken. Whether it was prescribed or not, I just feel like she's just gained a lot of weight. Okay. Now, it could be, too, that she doesn't. she's not getting exercise like she was before. So, I will say that. Maybe it's an exercise thing. So, it says, as we continue to explore what it means to be safe, one topic we've re revisited a number of times is how safe our young people are. From school bus rides and curfews for minors to accountability failures at the juvenile detention center. When it comes to youth violence, the same core question arises. Who is to blame when children hurt others? Is it them, the people surrounding them, the systems that fail them, or an influential mix of those things? The 2021 mass shooting at Oxford High School carried out by Ethan Crumbly, who was 15 years old at the time, prompted reflection of these questions. Prosecutors insisted that the parents knew Ethan was struggling with mental health issues and they failed to get him help, and both were convicted of involuntary manslaughter, which, by the way, they're going to be sentenced, uh, is that next week? 
No. Yeah, I got to figure out. When did they move Tracy Ferreter's trial back? Did I mark it on my calendar? Remember, Brooks comes up in May. Sarah Boone comes up in May. Okay, so Jennifer and James Crumbly are going to be sentenced on April 9th. So we'll we'll have that. We'll, I'll, I'll be live streaming that. It says... Uh, da, 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 da. Meanwhile, school officials, who some argue also failed Ethan Crumbly in multiple encounters, are protected from the prosecution under the state's qualified immunity laws. Okay, <clears throat> here's something I want to say about this. Do y'all remember, was it at the end of James or the end of Jennifer's trial? I'm going to have to find it, and I might have to piece it back into this video, so I'm going to have to do some editing before I upload this, where we talked about the lawsuits that were out there in the open from the parents. There were, vic well, victims, because there were victims involved in this that did not pass away. So you have them plus parents, and they're all filing lawsuits against the school, the school board, the county. They even filed a lawsuit against the police department, which I still don't understand, because what... I thought the police acted well on this one. I think they're just jumping on that Uvalde thing. But anyway, we spoke with Detroit Free Press court reporters, Tressa Baldus, who has covered the trial about the nuances at play in juvenile crime and the impact of the precedents these, ca these cases set. She states, what was unique about this case, and the prosecutor said this from the beginning, is that there were numerous egregious facts in this case. This was a different type of situation in that there were so many things the parents did or more so or more so didn't do that caused this to happen. She's right. I, I mean, I agree with that. I, I'm not my stance on this. Them being convicted is not that they did. It's not that they weren't guilty. They were guilty of being bad parents, yes. They were guilty of buying their, their son a gun when he obviously had issues that they were ignoring. The problem I have with it is, I, I, I just find it really difficult that they could have been convicted so quickly. I, I guess that's where I'm going with it. Because I, I felt like the jury wasn't out that long in, in both the cases. It, it surprised me that they were convicted. It really did when the jury knew what they were, you know, but we also know that there's going to be some appeals coming up on this. There's going to be a lot of appeals on this. And I, and this is nothing against the victims and the family and the lives that were lost. It's just that I feel like this is like they said, this it sets a precedence for what's going forward and how far are we going to let this go? You know, you buy your kid a car at the age of, 16 and before they turn 18 they're out drinking and driving um or, or 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 not even drinking and driving let's say that they're just out driving and they hurt someone so now you're going to go after the parents and and the parents can get man's uh involuntary manslaughter do you know what i mean there's so there's different cases like that where i just feel like there's it's 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 just it it worries me but i i still guess that it, None of that matters when you look at the fact that they put a gun in this child's hands and they didn't lock the gun up. I guess those are the two key things. Not, I guess you can put a gun in a child's hands if you're overseeing their activity with the gun, like going to the gun range or something like that, or going hunting, because this was a hunting community. But when it comes to their neglect, I just felt like neglect was the key thing there. Anyway, okay. I'll get off my soapbox. So it says, when the defense attorney would ask parents on the jury questions about whether parents should be held responsible if their child does something bad, she put it to them like this. How many of you have teenagers and you brought them a car as a gift? And then most of them said, yeah, we have. See, this is what I'm talking about. Then the defense asked, when you give this car to the child, do they think it's theirs? They said, yes. To which she said, but who actually owns this car? And they said, well, we do. We have the keys. The kids have the keys too, though. And then the defense went a step further and said, so if your child steals your car in the middle of the night, takes the car out and does something bad with it, and you don't know, is it your fault? And this was the analogy that the, of the Crumbly case. 
The prosecution said you brought you bought the child that gun. The kid went out and did something awful with it. And the parents defense in this case argued that it really wasn't a gift and that they didn't really give it to him. It was hidden in their room. It was only to be used with adult supervision. They didn't know he got it. They didn't know he was going to do this. And they had and that they had no idea. I don't think and and this is kind of what goes back to that is I do not think that they thought that this could possibly ever happen. I guess I, I almost want to say dumb about it. Yeah, they were dumb about it. But if somebody drinks and drives, let's say an adult drinks and drives and they get into an accident and someone's killed. Those are uh, manslaughter charges, right? Am I right? Don't those always get convicted? Somebody let me know in the chat what you think about this. So I just feel like if that's involuntary manslaughter, that's not the same as what happened here. Because are we going back to negligence? Are we going back to the negligence of, okay, I drank before I drove and I put myself behind a wheel and I was negligent for doing that. Okay, I bought my son a gun. And I didn't lock it up. So I'm negligent of not locking it up. But to be. But do you know what the consequences are. If a child gets a hold of a gun. And does something bad. Well I would think most of the time. Parents would lock up the guns. Just for the child's safety alone. Right. Not just for your own. And, and something that wasn't said. In this trial. That I thought was. That should have been said by the defense. Is if they had any thought that Ethan was capable of hurting anything himself, anyone, why would they not, if they thought he was depressed, if they thought he had mental issues, wouldn't their first thought have been that they didn't want to get him a gun because they didn't want him to hurt himself? Which leads me to believe that they didn't feel that he had an issue. Do you guys hear what I'm picking up? Do you understand what I'm picking up? I'm not really good at, at putting all this stuff down, which is why, you know, I'm just a mere little YouTuber with a small opinion. But th that's what I'm trying to say. So she, so she said, goes on to say that the prosecution claimed this was a rare bit for this type of prosecution for a couple of reasons. One of the prosecution maintained that this family had a troubled child who was spiraling out of control. He had mental health issues and the parents either knew them or should have known about them. And if they were paying more attention to their troubled child, then he would have, he would have gotten help instead of getting him a gun. This goes back to my point of when he was brought, when they, they're all jumping on the fact of why didn't they, why didn't they take him out of school that day? Okay, if you're going to say that, then why didn't the school make him go home? Don't blame the parents that they didn't take him home. They could have been saying, well, should we take him out of school? Was that even brought up in the conversation? I don't remember if it was brought up in the conversation. I remember that one of them, that one of the guys testified that he thought it should happen, but he wasn't the one to make that decision. It was up to, um, the counselor had said that. It wasn't his choice. He couldn't make that decision whether or not he should be sent home. So they couldn't say, you need to take your son home. There was somebody there that could have said that for, from the school administration, but they did not. So is, is that person as guilty as the person, as the parents who said, well, look, we're going to take him home. And this whole thing about we're going to get him help. Why, why didn't you get him help? Do you really think they could have taken him home? Pulled him out of school right at that meeting and then gotten him into a counselor session within the next hour? Because that's exactly what everybody's trying to say. It's like, oh, okay, were we supposed to see a schedule of a meeting that, that Jennifer had made over the phone to go see a counselor within the hour that they, that, you know what I'm saying? It all happened within like a two-hour time period. So that, I think, is unreasonable to go figure for that. Now, that being said. Because remember, I'm looking at both sides of this. I am trying to look at both sides of this. The other problem I have is they were only in there 10, 12 minutes in that in that meeting with the with the school. And the counselor was really adamant about he felt like they were just kind of nonchalant about the whole thing. Didn't Jennifer make the comments of, is that all? Can we go now? Or something like that. So yeah. Does that make her responsible 
I don't know. I think it just makes her a shit parent. But that she could be a shit person, you know? We don't know. Anyway. Okay. And when they had the opportunity to disclose that gun to the school, they didn't. Well, I don't know if I was a parent and I was called in, my, you know, and I got called in because my kid did something like that, that I would say, oh, I just bought him a gun. I'm not going to admit that to the school. So I, I, I don't see how that holds any point. If you're going to say that, then why the hell didn't the school uh, search the book bags? The, the school had the right to search his book bag and his car if he had one. You know what I mean? So they, unlike law, law enforcement couldn't have searched his book bag, but according to attorneys that I've seen, they say that the school could have stopped and gone through all of his possessions on school property right then and there, and they did not do it. So <coughs> I, I, mm, okay. In Michigan, there is a law that parents have a legal duty to control their minor child and to prevent that child from ca causing harm to others when there is foreseeable harm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is that the same without well, that's is that a law or is that just moral moral conduct? I, I don't know. So in other words, the prosecution maintained that the Crumbleys had a child who was problematic, who was suffering from mental health issues, and they had a duty to protect other kids from him. But instead of protecting other kids from him, they gave him this troubled child a gun. Again, I go back to the argument of if he had mental health issues, they would have been worried that he was going to use the gun on himself. If they thought he had health issues. Okay. You have two arguments to this. You have some who took this out. The, you have two arguments to this. You have some who look at this and say, oh. It's such a slippery slope, and we're going to see a ton of these cases. And then you have, which is what I'm saying, and then you have more moderate positions that say, well, that say we'll probably see a handful of them. We're not going to see everybody go crazy and try to charge every parent with every crime because it is hard to prove. I didn't think it was that hard to prove. I don't think that that, I don't know. I'm still on the fence about this one. Okay. That was just one of the many little things. The gun storage issue came up a lot during trial, and, and they were right on that. I agree on that. And the prosecutor actually demonstrated for the jury how easy it was to put the, the cable lock on the gun, and she did it in like 10 seconds. And that I agree on. The prosecution, though, through its witnesses, was able to argue that the gun that was used in the killing was not locked in a safe. The box that it was in was not locked. It did not have a cable lock on it. And there was no trigger lock on the gun itself. So all these little things that could have been done to make it more difficult for this kid to get the gun did not happen. I agree. He should have been able to do he, They should have done that. These were the small things that the parents could have done and I think resonated with the jury. If anything, like I said, if anything, they didn't do this. They should have done it for the safety of Ethan that he could have gotten a hold of the gun and accidentally hurt himself with it. Or he, couldn't, he could have gotten a hold of the gun and, and hurt himself intentionally with it. It's more of a message to parents who have guns in their house that if you're going to be a gun owner, you've got to be more careful. And I think that it's resonating out there, even for those of us who don't have guns. The trials definitely raised awareness for parents everywhere that you need to be more mindful of what your children are doing and how your children are feeling because this could happen to you. And there was some state member. Okay, we're going to go back to the one that everybody always talks about, Columbine. Uh, did you guys see the documentary that the one mom did? Not the not um, Eric, Eric Harris. Klebold. His mother did that documentary. Did you guys ever watch that? I feel like she was she was totally not aware of what her son was doing and going through. To me, she was completely in the dark on everything. But I also know that there are a ton of parents out there that are completely in the dark about what's going on with their children. Children lie. Children do things behind your back. That's just part of being a kid. And you don't want your parents to find out. And not parents don't always find out. So that was a really good article that they did here. Uh, give her kudos on that. Okay, now we got a jury thing. Oh. Oh. 
Listen to this. Sarnaev. I forget this guy's name. Is this the this is the Boston bomber guy, right? The marathon bomber. This was one day ago. Oh shoot. Who we spoke with say this is a waste of time and money. Here's what happened. The first circuit court of appeals in Boston says the judge fell short of investigating claims of juror bias presented to the court regarding the jury that decided whether Zernayev should live or die. The appeal focuses on two jurors who posted on social media about the marathon bombings and the trial. Zernayev's lawyers sought to have them removed, but the judge declined. We spoke with a bombing survivor who's upset by this and says it is a waste of time. It doesn't yeah, change his actions. Removed. His actions were what he did. He put a bomb down next to a whole bunch of innocent people and he killed two people at that bombing site and injured hundreds and amputated many. The federal appeals court says the two jurors will need to return to court for questioning. If there is a disqualifying bias found, a new jury would be impaneled to decide if Zarnayev should face the death penalty. None of this changes Zarnayev's conviction, though, and he does face life in prison. We're live in Boston this morning. Jennifer Egan, WCVB News Center 5. Yeah, he should be. He's guilty. I mean, there's no... there. That one, there is no question as to guilt right there. That one, you know, he was guilty. That's interesting. Oh, when did this happen? Hang on. Hold on. This, oh, you guys remember the girl who faked her kidnapping? I forgot all about this. I remember that it was, um, Ick and Mel was following this really heavily. Because they were making all kinds of, um, they were making a lot of jokes about it. But this, this was weird. This was a weird case. So it says, this was the Alabama woman who admitted to faking her own kidnapping last year apologized in court Thursday after pleading guilty to two misdemeanor charges of making a false police report. She said, she said, I made a grave mistake while trying to fight through various emotional issues and stress. She's 26 years old. She said, I am extremely remorseful for the panic, fear, and various range of negative emotions that were experienced across the nation. I want to specifically acknowledge and take accountability for the pain and embarrassment that I inflicted upon my family, my church family, friends, neighbors, community, and all those who were directly involved in the search efforts for me. She was sentenced to one year of supervised probation, 100 hours of community service, ooh, and $17,974 in restitution. That's going to hit her harder than anything, probably. Let's hope her parents don't pay that for her, okay? Wasn't she rich? If I remember correctly, they had money. Russell acknowledged she is receiving mental health counseling and was told by the judge to continue the counseling as a condition of her probation. Russell captured the nation's attention when she mysteriously disappeared in July of 2023 after calling 911 to report a child walking along a highway. Officers arrived at the site and found her vehicle and personal items, but Russell was nowhere to be found. After a nearly 49-hour police search, Russell returned home and said she had been abducted. She was held hostage and escaped her captors. Authorities continued investigating and found Russell's web searches, including things like, do you have to pay for an Amber Alert? And how to make money from a register without being caught. Oh, how to take money from a register without being caught. Oh, that's right. I forgot she stole money from her work. She later admitted that the, kidnap the kidnapping was all a hoax. In October, a municipal court judge found Russell guilty of two misdemeanors, charges of false reporting to law enforcement authorities and falsely reporting an incident. She had initially pleaded not guilty to those charges and her attorneys said at the time that they planned to appeal her case. Later that month, the Jefferson County Circuit Court scheduled a jury trial for March according to her court records. But earlier this month, <clears throat> later that month, the Jefferson County Circuit Court scheduled a jury trial for March according to the court records. But earlier this month, the Circuit Court scheduled Russell's plea hearing. 
Russell also apologized Thursday to authorities and personnel who were involved in the search for her. She said, I also extend my sincerest apologies to the Hoover Police Department and every other law enforcement agency and personnel for the position that I put them in and for the resources used. I wholeheartedly can say that I never had any malicious intent to hurt anyone, and I pray you will feel my sincerity. And I pray that you will feel my sincerity and that as I prepare to pick up the pieces and go on to restore my life, that you will witness through the fruition of grace. Oh, yeah, somebody wrote that for her. After the sentencing, Hoover police chief told reporters that he was disappointed with the sentence. He said, I'm very disappointed in the decision, the decision not to give any jail time. She gave an apology today. And unfortunately to me, it's like seven, eight months late. I don't know why we didn't hear that back in July. He's right. When asked about the restitution, he said the real figure should probably be in the 40s, at least 40 to 50,000 for all the money that we spent. That was the police department. Spent 40 to 50,000. Yeah, that's true. Why didn't they give her more? Interesting, eh? I'll throw a pick up picture up of her so you guys can Maybe we'll do a short video on what happened so that you guys can, if you've forgotten about this case, it'll kind of help you remember, remember it. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for being here with me. This was short and sweet. Well, not really. I've been on for an hour babbling. And if you stayed through all of my babbling, well, well then God bless you. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you enjoyed this video, please do not forget to like and subscribe on your way out. And feel free to leave a comment. Have a blessed day.